Hey, everybody. I'm uh, here with Jeff Goins from GoinsWriter.com. And uh, Jeff, actually, you told me last time we interviewed, I should have watched that interview, how to pronounce your last name specifically. Can you clear that up for people? I will. Uh, but uh, I, I have this policy of not correcting people because it's it's OK. Uh, it's Goins, like coins, yep, but with a Goins. G. And the reason that I'm ambivalent about that is because my parents are from Chicago uh, I now live in Tennessee, uh, but my dad's parents and all of his family and all of the, uh, you know, the people who bear our surname are from Alabama or the South. Ah. And and they all say Goins, which we didn't realize until we moved back South and realized we've been saying Goins for 18 years. Uh, and, you know, it's actually Goins. So as for me and my house, we're <laughs> Goins, but it just depends. Uh, such is the life we live as Americans with no sense for where that name came from or, yeah. you know, it just becomes what it is. Totally. Uh, well, thanks for coming on. And um, I really want to talk to you about earning a living as a writer. This is something I know you have a lot of experience with. I know that you've also worked with a lot of people to help them figure out how they're going to earn a living as a writer. It's something you write about regularly on your blog. Um, for people who don't know you. Uh, you run a blog and a podcast. Tell us about those. Sure. Well, my blog is Goins, just like my last name, GoinsWriter.com. And I tried to get JeffGoins.com, but some guy in like Virginia uh, is a realtor and he just won't give that up. He wants that for like his kids, uh, such as the life of, you know, the 21st century where you're, um, you know, your legacy for your, ch your children is a URL. Is, is <laughs> uh, yeah. So my blog is basically a, a, a blog uh, kind of about writing and creativity and uh, really just my experience of becoming a writer and and sharing that that publicly and, and trying to be, um, you know, not just writing memoir or something, but trying to be instructive through the process. So a lot of writers, artists, some entrepreneurs uh, read it uh, just because I'm, you know, sharing the journey of, of how I um, first became a writer. Uh, then how I made the leap from, you know, doing it as a hobby to doing it full time and now how I continue to sustain that career. And the podcast is called The Portfolio Life, a little bit broader of a, of a subject where um, I talk about how artists and entrepreneurs have to organize their life, not as just like one thing that you do, but as a portfolio of, of activities of different kinds of work in order to um, support yourself and also to uh, live a fulfilled life. What is your history um, as a writer? How, you know, when did you first get interested in writing um, and how long were you, did you consider yourself a writer for before you actually earned a living at it? I can't remember who said this, but um, uh, somebody wise once said, uh, we uh, live our lives forward, but we uh, understand them backwards. And, and so uh, I, I share that to say that I've always been a writer. I've always written uh, since I was, you know, uh, I don't know, 10 years old. And I, I remember, uh, coming home one day and opening up a spiral notebook and starting to write a story about gargoyles. And I think I just seen like Jurassic park and was just ripping off that plot, uh, but just exchanged the dinosaurs for gargoyles and, you know, felt original. Um, but I, you know, that's, that's the earliest memory I have of writing, but I've been writing my whole life, but I never really thought of myself as a writer until a few years ago mm -hmm. when I was having a conversation with a friend. I'd been working for a nonprofit organization for about five or six years uh, doing marketing work, doing a lot of online marketing. Um, and so I, I knew about social media. I knew about content marketing. I was doing a lot of it for my day job. Um, but I, I didn't think that I was like, that was the thing that I was supposed to do. So I was having this conversation with my friend. He asked me what my dream was. And I said it was to be a writer. And I said that like very reluctantly as a, a lot of writers I meet uh, do and say, they go, ah, I write, but I'm not really a writer because um, we're sort of waiting for some, uh, you know, something to qualify us. As Seth Godin would say, we're waiting for a bigger badge. Um, and he says, well, you don't have to want to be a writer. You are a writer. You just need to write. And that was a conversation that kind of began my journey. Uh, after that, I, I started calling myself a writer. I'd meet people at a party or something and I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm a writer. And, and the next natural question is, well, what do you write? And I thought, oh, like I have to get to work. And so that's when I started my blog and I started um, uh, sharing some of the things that I was uh, learning as a writer. I had had some experience doing some limited freelance writing in my 20s. And uh, but 
after that moment, I started writing every day. I got up at 5 a.m. for a year and wrote every day for at least an hour or two. And, and that was the year of practice I needed mm -hmm. necessary to do what Stephen Pressfield calls turn pro, mm -hmm. which ha happened first in my head. And then, you know, as I built the blog and started to attract some attention around my work, you know, a bunch of cool things happened after that. Was that uh, first, that year of, of writing when you got up every day, uh, was that stuff that you published or was it all... Yeah, it was all on my blog. So basically I wrote seven blog posts a week for a year. And that year I wrote guest content for probably a hundred different blogs. Um, this and, was in, uh, was this in 2010 or 2011 when I first yeah. discovered you probably? Right. It, so we had that chat probably right, right in the middle of that or towards the end of it. Got it. Um, Okay, so you, you start writing every day, you're getting some attention for your work, uh, you have admitted to yourself that you're a writer and you've started to have that conversation, at least internally, about what it means to go pro. Mm -hmm. Where did you think uh, you would go with that to? So did you want to earn a living as a writer? Was that the next logical step for you? I, I think that that was like a, a distant idea, but it seemed so far off that I didn't entertain it. I remember reading Darren Rouse from Pro Blogger, uh, write you know write a blog post or do an interview, and he said that the first year that he monetized his blog, he made like thirty thousand dollars, and and he was sort of trying to debunk this idea that you can go from you know zero to sixty in you know zero seconds or something, uh, and I read that thinking. Wow, that sounds like a lot of money. I, I couldn't even imagine making that much money uh, online. Like that seemed unapproachable to me. So I had pretty low expectations. What I did want to do, I wanted to do, to do two things, and the goals kind of evolved. Uh, but first, I just wanted to be heard. You know, I, I every writer, I think, if they're being honest, wants to share their work, wants to express themselves, uh, but also wants to know that they're making a difference with their words. And so that was my primary motivation. Um, you know, I had written eight different blogs over the past, you know, seven or eight years, and they had all failed miserably. I'd mm -hmm. had, you know, a total of like 200 readers. And so I just wanted to know that people were listening. There was probably a certain amount of uh, ego or just, you know, the, the um, uh, the, the, the desire to have a, you know, a life that mattered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, and part of that for me as a writer was knowing that, you know, my words were making a difference. The second goal, which kind of helped, uh, happened, uh, as, uh, you know, life started to evolve was I did start thinking, could I make some money off of this? It wasn't great, some great big dream, but during that year, my wife and I got pregnant and uh, we had talked about her potentially staying home to raise the baby, to raise our son. And so when that actually happened, it became real. Uh, I got r really focused and decided I'm going to figure out a way to replace my wife's income uh, so that she doesn't have to work. And then I'll just kind of have two jobs. I'll have this side gig and then I'll have my day job. And that was my plan initially. Mm. So you'll have the side gig and you'll have your day job. And, and how are you going to get from... Uh, point A to point B revenue wise. Did you have, did you have some specific thing in mind? Were you going to try to get a book deal or what was, what was the first step you thought you would take? So that year that I was writing, uh, that, that first year, uh, at about month eight, a publisher, a traditional publisher contacted me. Uh, they gave, I got a book deal. I signed a book deal. It wasn't much money. It was like $6,000 for the advance. Uh, and, uh, that's, I, that, that I think is, is a myth that writers still believe today that if I just get a book published, I'll have arrived. Right. And cer certainly there, there are those stories of six figure and seven figure advances, but those are few and far between. And most professional writers, uh, I know are having to hodgepodge a bunch of different revenue streams together. Uh, so I knew that, I mean, that was, um, you know, that was a realistic expectation. Yeah. So when I, when I signed the book deal, I was like, okay, this is cool. And I've kind of been legitimized now as, as a writer. Maybe there's some other, you know, uh, income sources that I can build around this blog and around this attention. Uh, so I didn't really have an idea. Um, and I didn't know that people would pay me for anything. I had very low expectations. I'd given away so much content on my blog. I wondered what could I create that people would want to buy. And at the end of that year, I did a survey. A friend told me to do this. A guy named Sean Platt told me to do this, um, who's made a, a great living as a writer online. 
And I did a survey and I basically just asked people, what do you want and what would you pay for it? And a lot of people, I mean, they said a bunch of different things, eBooks, courses, coaching, whatever. But a lot of people said an eBook and that they'd pay anywhere from like five to $50. And so uh, I started working on an eBook. Was there a specific topic for the eBook that you, did you say, would you like an eBook on X, Y, and Z or just an eBook in general is what people wanted? Yeah, I asked about the subject and I think, you know, most people said we wanted to hear more about writing or blogging, Mm. Um, which at at that point I had sort of established myself as some kind of expert, you know, in a certain uh, uh, group of people. Yeah. Um, So I didn't know what I was going to write it about and I was talking to a friend. I had actually just done one of my first public speaking gigs. And I had basically told this story about how my blog grew over the course of a year from zero to 10,000 email subscribers. I was having about 50,000 unique visitors uh, that eventually, you know, grew to hundreds of thousands uniques and uh, tens of thousands of, of email subscribers, but, you know, pretty decent growth in 12 months. And so I was, um, I told this story um, and, and I, and I shared the story during the speaking gig that I shared with you about how I started calling myself a writer. And, and so Right after that, I was talking to a friend and I was saying, hey, I want to write an ebook and sell it. And I was thinking about calling it like how to get 10,000 emails in six months or something. And she's like, no, no, no. You need to call it. You are a writer because when you did that speaking gig, like 500 people tweeted out, I am a writer because they heard that story Ah. and and it gave them the confidence to make that declaration themselves. And so that's what I did. I wrote that. Don't, don't you love when something is handed to you like that? Yeah. A, a great yeah. title as opposed to yeah. just racking your brain for it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's uh, I love that that Derek Seavers uh, quote where he says, what's obvious to you is amazing to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And, and that story was very obvious to me and it was transformative to me. But I just sort of overlooked it. Yep. And uh, it is to this day, I'll meet people, you know, that I've never met in person before. And they've read that ebook and they go, when I read that, I immediately started calling myself a writer, which is pretty cool. So I don't want to gloss over the the whole book deal part of this yeah. equation because Um, you know, we're talking about how to earn a living as a writer. And I think a lot of people feel like the book deal is the ultimate fulfillment of that. And you mentioned, you know, there are six and seven figure, uh, advances out there. Mm -hmm. However, I have a feeling that, um, if you're going to get a six or seven figure advance, you know, already that you're going to get a six or seven figure advance because you're famous from Mm -hmm. some other space already, or you have some incredible thing happen to you that went, you know, national in terms of attention. Mm -hmm. So most people, especially if you're a no name uh, to begin with, or, you know, you have a very small audience, you're going to be looking at, you know, five figures if you're lucky for an advance. Yep. Right. And so that's not going to be a life changing experience. And I liken this to um, raising venture capital or to getting investors for your business. I think a lot of people think that, oh, that company raised venture capital. That means they're set. That's not what it means at all, because investors, just like publishers, take a lot of bets on a lot of different people. They might give 100 people at small advances, and they're hoping that 20 of them end up, you know, breaking even for them and that 10 of them end up like making a lot of money for the publisher. So just because a publisher gives you an advance, that means that you, they think you're good enough to at least take a shot on, but it doesn't mean that they know that you're going to be a breakthrough success. There's no way to know that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, so were you disheartened with the, with the whole book deal? Um, or you, or did you feel like it was just one step and you kind of already knew that you were going to have to look for alternative revenue streams? I wasn't disappointed because keep in mind, this is the dream of, of every writer is to get a book deal, yeah. right? To have some gatekeeper. And we can say all we want that, it, you know, you don't have to, you know, uh, wait to be picked. But every writer deep down inside, when I've talked to them, almost all of them think of the traditional book contract as, you know, this this golden ticket. And and there's, there's some really great stuff about working with a traditional publisher and there's some, some not so great stuff. And I've done both self-publishing and traditional publishing. But I knew I didn't have some big expectation that I was going to make a bunch of money. I just, you know, I knew that I I had friends who were writers. Most of them had part-time jobs or, you know, were bivocational in in some sense. 
so that was uh, that was a huge honor, and I got to work on that book, and I leveraged that to continue to build my platform. And I realized I was kind of doing two different things. I was writing. I was writing about uh, subjects offline that were interesting to me and I found inspiring and I wanted to share them. I was writing basically inspirational nonfiction. And then online, I was kind of sharing a lot of the process uh, of being a writer that I was going through and what I was learning about publishing and editing uh, on my blog. Mm -hmm. And so I just figured that there was probably something that I could do with that attention to... um, turn that into some sort of, uh, you know, business or, or, or product. And for me, it was this idea of how can I kind of put together a bunch of different things that I'm doing in a way that's going to generate enough money. And I didn't have huge aspirations at the time. You know, I was working for a nonprofit. I was making less than $40,000 a year. Um, and I was, I was totally happy with that. Um, but I just was trying to, you know, cobble together a bunch of little different things to figure out a way to, uh, at least replace my wife's income, which was comparable to mine. And, and then, you know, that would, that would be it. So at the time you were still working, uh, for the nonprofit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And uh, I'm a pretty conservative guy. Like I'm not one of those guys who believes that you, you know, leap and, and, and let the The net net appear. appear. Mm -hmm. Like I want to build a bridge to the other side. I don't want (laughs) to like leap and hope I I get to the other side or, you know, use one of those super Mario brothers trampolines. That'd be Uh, cool. Yeah. Early nineties Nintendo (laughs) reference for you kids out there. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, you know, getting the traditional book contract was cool. Uh, and it was money. I was getting paid to write. Uh, the most I'd gotten up to that point was maybe a few hundred dollars for, you know, some article that I'd written. So it was an honor and it was, it was the first step in the process of, you know, figuring out a way to, to, to make a living as a writer And, and any, artist uh, knows this and frankly any freelancer entrepreneur knows this that um, you know you have to start somewhere mm-hmm. and um, and you have to look for lots of different opportunities to you know bring in revenue and there are some things where you go oh this is going to be a great deal and it's not and then there are other things where you go nah, whatever I'm just going to try this and it ends up being a huge success and that going back to you know an earlier question that's what ended up happening with this ebook okay. you are a writer yeah. So, and when did that come out? Uh, and what, and what was the timing versus the book? Yeah, it's a funny, it was a funny thing because basically I, I signed the book contract in the fall of 2011. And then by like January of 2012, I did that survey. And, uh, and, and at this point our, our son was, um, you know, due in June and I was, I was feeling a little bit of pressure, you know, a $6,000 advance wasn't going to cut it. And I, and my wife had, you know, a maternity leave of a couple of months. So I had a little bit of, you know, like a four or five month ramp to try to figure this out. So I think in February, I decided I would write the book, um, the, the ebook. And so I'd actually finished the traditional book first, and then I started working on the ebook and that ended up coming out in May. And I checked with my publisher and said, hey, I'm going to write this little ebook about writing. It's not going to have anything to do with, you know, this other book that I'm writing. There won't be any, you know, conflict of interest, you know, different markets. And they said, fine. And so that book came out in May. And um, within, you know, the first month or so, we did about $16,000 in sales uh, just through my website, at just selling the PDF for five bucks a piece. And then, um, and then the Amazon sales started to kick in and actually for the next few months, the sales would double, uh, you know, every month. So Amazon we ended up, sales of the, uh, ebook. So you published yeah. it on Amazon as well. Yeah. So I was selling the PDF. I had 10,000 email subscribers, uh, you know, and so a lot of people wanted, wanted the book. I sold it directly to my audience. Uh, and then I, I put it shortly after it launched, I put it on, um, Amazon and a lot of people bought it on Amazon and it, you know, became a bestseller on Amazon. And, uh, just with that ebook, I eventually did some product packages. I did like a five, 10 and $20 package just with like a worksheet and an audio program. But by the end of the year, just off of that one product, we'd made $50,000. Wow. Yeah. And that was, that was like my first real product launch. Yep. And I remember lying in bed. So my wife's pregnant. We're like a month. O- well, uh, our son had just been born. Our son, you know, it was May and our son had just been born. He was born a month early, uh, which was a you know, whole other thing. Yeah. So I'm lying in bed looking at my iPhone at nine o'clock at night. And I'm just, you know, I'm seeing all these sales come in, refreshing my email because it's addicting. 
And I, you know, turn to my wife at one point and I go, man, we just made like $250 this hour. And I, I never made here. Yeah. I never made $250 an hour yeah. doing anything, much right. less lying in bed. <laughs> of course, there was that whole year that you had to get up and write a blog post every day. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> um, so at this point, are you thinking to yourself, well, geez, I can just write an ebook once a year and maybe I can get by that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, what I did right before this ebook came out was I basically did, you know, what, what Eric Rees calls a minimum viable product where I did right after that survey came out, I did a very short ebook that I sold for like a couple of weeks. I made $1,500 off of that. Uh, and then I took it down and then I spent a couple of months working on, you know, turning it into your, you are writer. Cause it just, it wasn't very good. And I just wanted to see if people would actually pay for something and they did. Uh, so I, I, um, when, when that happened, I thought I could just do this once a month, like, like very realistically, I'll just write a book a month. Um, so when that happened, yeah, I, I, um, I knew that, that, uh, that my wife was good. And, and I thought I, I could, you know, write a book or two a year doing this. And I got a lot, that book got a lot of reception from people. And pretty quickly people started asking me to put together an online course based on a lot of that content on my blog mm -hmm. and in the book. And I had heard of this happening. You know, I'd heard of people doing online courses. They're, you know, they're a lot more common now, but a few years ago, it was still kind of a newer thing to do, uh, you know, in the world of, um, you know, online business. A lot of people were doing eBooks and, you know, eBook bundles and things. Um, so, I, I, I thought this, this would be cool. And people were just asking me to do this. And so right before the book came out, I bought a URL and I actually put that URL at the end of the book, um, to say, and it, it was literally just a URL, a, a, you know, a, a splash page and, um, and it just had like an email opt-in. Like if you want to find more about how to, you know, uh, become a writer, you know, enter your email here. And I didn't, ha hadn't built the course or anything. I just wanted to see if people were interested in something like that. So the book came out, it did really well. And it, and it sent everybody to this URL, tribewriters.com, where I thought maybe someday I'll put, put a course here or something. And um, that fall, my book came out a month after that, uh, I, I launched the course. Oh, wow. You move fast. Well, I mean, I was really motivated. You yeah. know, I, I, I was trying, I just had a kid, you know, and that's expensive. And my, um, you know, I, I didn't want my wife to have to go back to work and I, you know, I'm pretty conservative. And so I was like, we need lots of money, you know, cause this could run out at any time, you know? Mm. Uh, so I, I did, I launched that, um, I launched that course mostly because people have been asking for it and I'd been telling people about it. You know, I bought the URL in like February, anticipating that I might do something with it. And then I would just, I would write, you know, weekly newsletters to my email list and I would tease that out and I would say, hey, this is coming soon. And so, you know, we built up a list of like, I don't know, 2000 people on, on that uh, email list. And mm -hmm. then the course came out and we sold 450 spots to the first class. So you mentioned um, earlier, I think before we started recording that that course now accounts for the lion's share of your revenue. Is that true? Yeah, I think it's about 80 okay. uh, percent. It might be closer to 70 now. I've been you know, doing some other things trying to diversify. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 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 a big deal. And you open it up uh, multiple times a year. Yeah, three to four times a year. I think we'll do four launches this year. OK, great. Um, are there any other revenue sources at this point? So back in the day, you know, so I started my blog and people were, you know, talking about monetization as if this was like this switch that you could turn and like money would just start coming yeah. in. Like it doesn't take work or, you know, business acumen or relationships or anything. It just happens. So when I was like, oh, how do I monetize this? Where is the switch? <laughs> uh, I tried advertising, made a few hundred dollars off of that. Nothing, you know, substantial. And, um, I started doing some affiliate stuff. I started with Amazon and initially my goal for that was to just pay hosting fees, uh, you know, email marketing costs and, you know, started to, you know, make a few hundred dollars a month off of that covering most of those expenses. And then I've done, you know, I've done some joint venture, uh, affiliate stuff. I still do a few of those a year, you know, webinars or, you know, some sort of promotion to my email list on a product that I use and recommend. And, you know, it's really quality. 
Um, so I, I do that and um, I, I still write books. I've written two traditionally published books. I wrote that self-published book uh, and I'm working on a, on a third book. And some speaking, I do a little bit of coaching and consulting. Um, my goal with the business is I don't want to be dependent on any single revenue stream. And at the same time, I want every revenue stream or each revenue stream to be strong enough that I could live off of just one of them. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's the case right now, you know, in terms of like, you know, these affiliates, that would be one stream, uh, you know, um, speaking would be another. Yep traditional books would be another. So, yeah. Do you feel like, um, this is interesting, all of the different revenue streams and things when you, when someone thinks about earning a living as a writer and when you think about other writers, maybe who have been in the game longer and have bigger profiles, do you feel like they have as many different revenue streams? Um, is this common for writers to have four or five different revenue streams? Uh, it is. I don't know that they all think of it that way. I mean, I think that there are probably a couple of different types of writers. There's, you know, lots of different types of writers, I'm sure. But I think in respect, with respect to entrepreneurship, there are those who just want to write and are good enough or are popular enough where they can just make money off of their, you know, book advances. And if you're getting a million dollar advance every few years that you write a book, first of all, you're commanding, you know, you're, you're popular enough that you're commanding decent speaking fees mm -hmm. and, and probably doing some other things. We're talking about like Malcolm Gladwell level people. Exactly. Yeah. Seth Godin, you know, yeah. people who are, are getting seven figure advances and are getting, you know, six figure speaking fees for every gig that they do. Um, and so in between books, I mean, they're at a point where they're financially independent. Uh, you know, they've written, a, you know, several best-selling books that have sold millions of copies and, and then, you know, in between those books, they're, yeah, they're doing speaking mostly. Um, so there's that kind of writer. And, and then there's, I think the more entrepreneurial kind, um, which, you know, goes from like people like Michael Hyatt, you know, who's a friend of mine and, you know, just, just down the hall, um, who is a writer and he's a popular writer, but he's also a popular blogger and he's built a very successful uh, online business. Uh, and then there's, you know, the, the, the typical working writer who has to do it to survive. You know, they have to speak a little bit. They have to do some some writing coaching as one of my friends does and she makes really good living off of that. Uh, they have to do uh, ghost writing or editing. Teaching maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this idea that you're going to be a full-time writer and all you're ever going to do is write. Uh, I'm not going to say it's a myth because some people do it, uh, but most don't or can't, uh, you know, and I don't, I don't even know if Stephen King does that. I mean, he could do it, but I, I think <laughs> we're multifaceted people. Yeah. And for me, doing one thing is boring. Totally. And I think, I think this is why Stephen King has a band that he plays in local bars with because yeah. Even a writer just can't spend all day, every day writing. You have to have other things. And so for me, I'm more of an entrepreneurial type. Uh, the business is just another creative outlet. But most writers who are making a full-time living are doing it by doing things other than just writing their books. It's funny how, you know, we we all identify in different camps. There are people who say I'm a, I'm a writer, people who say maybe I'm a software developer, people who say yeah. I'm a podcaster. But- you know, it seems like we're all overlapping more and more as we share, you know, what works and as the the different media, I think, kind of blend into one another a little bit more yeah. every year. It seems like you just started a podcast and, yeah. you know, uh, you don't call yourself a podcaster, although you are a podcaster now because you yeah. have a podcast. So it's just interesting to kind of see how those th those edges um, bleed into one another, I think. I read an interesting book that not a lot of people have heard about that I highly recommend called The Age of Unreason by mm. Charles Handy, which is an old business book from 1989. And in that book, uh, it's a book about the future of organizations, basically. And in that book, he makes a prediction that um, he has a chapter called Portfolios. And this is the first person that I know that coined the term portfolio life, which is a term that I, ah. uh, that's the name of my podcast and uh, an idea that I think is pretty cool. Uh, but basically he said that in the future, most workers aren't going to have some 40 year old 
career and then they just get their pension. Most workers and most organizations are going to have sort of a portfolio basis of how they, they manage work, uh, meaning that your career is going to look like, well, I do this thing for a little while and I do this thing and I hodgepodge all these things together. And uh, this is just, this is the world. This is the way the world is going. He predicted this in 1989. And most workers are going to have to figure out what their portfolio looks like because uh, in the future we will all be what he calls portfolio people. Yeah. And interestingly enough, as you probably know, Forbes came out with a study not too long ago where they said by the year 2030, over half of the American population is going to be freelance. Freelance, which is basically what we're talking about. You know, freelancers aren't just doing one thing. They're doing a bunch of different gigs and they hodgepodge those together into what's hopefully a full-time income. And I, I agree. I think culture is moving in this way where uh, I think deep down inside people would go, well, I'm not just one thing, but there's this sort of social pressure to, well, you got to have a job title. Well, the world is going the way of you know, having a much more multifaceted career. And maybe we should think of smarter titles to describe those careers. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Um, and you know, the, the people that I see who are doing the best and really, um, just enjoying what they do, they all seem to be following that portfolio strategy now. Um, so it's interesting to, to hear it sort of summed up that way. Yeah. Um, Jeff, this has been fantastic. Do you have any last minute advice for, people who are kind of on the fence about earning a living as a writer? Yeah, well, I think that there's tension here. You know, I don't, I'm not one of those people who believes in balance. I believe that life is about managing tension. And one of the, cha one of the challenges and one of the, the main tensions that I am constantly dealing with is this tension between art and work. Art is the thing that I do because I feel called to do it, because it's fun to do, because it's a form of artistic expression. It's the reason I'm on the 11th edit of my book, changing phrases that probably no one will notice but me, because I just feel like this is what the craft deserves. Mm -hmm. And then work is the stuff that I do that I like too, that I do primarily to, to make a living. And I think every writer has to deal with that tension um, in their own way. But I think that something that was helpful to me initially was to embrace the fact that I'm not just writing for the sake of writing, which is, I love doing that. The art artist in me loves that, but I'm also doing it to reach people. And I think if you want to succeed as a writer today, um, yes, content is king or, uh, you know, it, it's certainly important, um, but relationships, audience, connecting with those people, platform, uh, that's queen, if not, you know, if not king itself, um, that's, that's just as important. So if you want, if you want to make a living as a full-time writer, you have to care at some point, you have to care about the audience that you're writing for. Um, otherwise it's going to be hard to get a book deal. It's going to be hard to sell an online product. And it's certainly going to be hard to build any kind of online platform, which is what makes a lot of this possible. Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And, uh, I, I love chatting with you. We should do this more often. Likewise. Thanks, Corbett. Thank you.